one. Well, hey, we're going to start session two of the Servant Way here in a minute, and excited to be back with these guys. Uh, Blake was wearing all those scarfs this morning when he woke up because it was chilly when he walked the dog. But uh, as you can see, he's got quite a collection. So we're going we're gonna to talk about those here in a minute. But, um, but yeah, we're thankful you're joining us. I hope you enjoyed session one. Session two, the focus uh, before we get started is, is going to be on development, how, how we're developed by God's grace. And we know that, that there's some things that we may look at our life and we, we may say, we want these things to change, but there also may be some things in our life that we don't want to change. There may be some things that we enjoy and we love more than the Lord. And although it may be pr uh, producing consequences, um, it may pr be producing struggles. It may be producing uh, anxieties and, and things that are causing um, a lack of peace and a, a lack of joy. Um, we entertain those things. And we know as a, as a believer, if, we're, if we've trusted in Christ, then we, 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 we should often pray, God, help me not to entertain the things that you've died for. And so we're going we're gonna to work through session two on how forgiveness produces freedom, but also how God's grace frees us daily to fight our sin and to, to acknowledge our sin. And I know Michael ended the call last time when we, we got off and he said, man, I wish I would have shared this, but he, he gave a statement and said, uh, God's grace helps us face our sin. And so session two is going to really be about how can we confront sinfulness in us and, and how does grace help us not only to be free to confront it, but also how does it allow others to be in our life to see the sin that we see every day? And there's things that we may hide or keep from others, but when we bring it into the light and ultimately the gospel allows us to do that, when we do that, we know that God is not, he's not mad at us. He's, he's not shaming us. Um, he's not guilting us, but he's revealing things to us for our good that we would grow and be, become more like him. And it's going to free us up in a lot of areas of our life to, to live in him and to be, uh, be joyful and thankful and rejoicing and all these things that, that the spirit produces in us. And we're going to see a little bit later in Galatians five on how, what that looks like. But, um, but Blake, what what in the world are all those scarfs doing on your wall? Um, well, I had no clue Brandon was going to ask me this, but I uh, I'm a big supporter of local uh, lower division soccer in the United States, um, and so I'm a big football guy who got really into FIFA in college and then made some really good friends kind of on the lower level soccer circuit. So these scarves behind me here are Asheville City Soccer Club um, out of Asheville, North Carolina. Then the three behind me are Greenville FC out of Greenville, South Carolina, a team that I was really – actually both of these teams, I was kind of in the ground floor helping them get started, helping with their fan support. Um, and so all of those teams are really close to me. And then these two on this side are obviously Chelsea from the Premier League and then Orlando City um, soccer, just a cool scarf there. So I'm excited about Charlotte getting MLS and, and just being more involved in soccer here with Charlotte Independence and all kinds of lower level soccer. So that's really what all that is. And I just think the scarves are a really cool tradition in soccer. And I think they display super well on my wall. So that's why I have them there, bro. Yeah, it looks good, man. Um... Yeah, it is pretty cool, Charlotte, getting a soccer team. Yeah. I'm just curious about what's going to happen with the Panther Stadium. Yeah, hopefully Tepper forks up the money and renovates Bank of America because I think moving to Oakboro or anywhere outside of the city will be a huge, like, downgrade for everybody. Michael, how do you feel about that? I mean, uh, I'm a fan of the scarves. And uh, I'm a fan of the Panther Stadium. And I hope it stays. <laughs> I agree. Man of Michael, it's so political. Man of few. <laughs> Just keep it short and simple. Don't say much. So, Blake, did you, did you ever play soccer? I know you mentioned you you like football. Is that football? Or I know you played football, like the pigskin. But did you kick the little soccer <laughs> ball around? I played soccer one year, my freshman year of high school. Um, 
I wanted to help get quicker feet for American football. And my, the JV football coach was also the JV soccer coach. And he brought me on the team to be the bruiser. And so when we would play another team, if they had a really good player, he would sub me in to fight the other player to help us both get red cards. Wow. And that actually happened a lot. I think I had 12 red cards that year. But that was before, wow. I, that was before I knew Jesus. So I was always looking for a fight. 12 red cards. That's a true story. Yeah, really. Like 12 red cards in like 19 games. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, it got to the point where I was pretty reckless. Like he would sub me in and I would go in and they wouldn't even start play yet. And I would just start fighting. So you technically should have been on a hockey team. Yes, that would have been growing up in South Carolina. Those didn't really exist. But yes, that would have been the best fit for me. Wow. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. Cool. So if, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's quite the statistic. It's quite the statistic. Well, Hey, let's, um, let's go ahead and dig in and I'm going to start us out by just referring back to a couple of scriptures that we talked about. And, uh, I got my Bible opened and if you're on this call, you're welcome to, you're welcome to follow along as we read some scriptures. Uh, these are going to be posted in our, in our study guide as well. So you can, you can kind of dig into them. But in Romans 5, uh, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase and give some, give some uh, short overviews on what, what we've talked about and what's been shared. But in starting in verse 6, it says uh, that we're, while we're still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. And it continues to say that God shows his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were God's enemy, we were apart from him. We did not know him from birth. Um, we didn't always just grow up in the, as a believer because we've grown up in the church or because our family uh, may have been believers or we lived in a Christian home. It, it's a personal decision that we have to make um, with God. And, and we are all enemies. There's none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3 tells us. But it continues to say, since therefore we've been justified by his blood or we've been made right by the blood of Jesus, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if we're, we're enemies, we've been reconciled by his death. And it says much more now that we're, we've been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? And we have reconciliation. We, we, things have been made right between us and God uh, because of the shed blood of Christ. And it talks later on in, in, in Romans 5 about the gift uh, of Jesus, that even though there's one man's trespass that brought death, it brought judgment and condemnation. It says that the free gift followed, uh, that followed many trespasses, it brought justification. So it made things right. This free gift, which is Jesus in his finished work on the cross. And it says that, that even though this man's death or this man's trespass brought death, and that's referring back to Adam uh, in the garden, that he was our representative. Uh, he represented all of mankind in the garden. But now we have a new representative. We have Jesus. That is a gift for us that we might receive righteousness and eternal life. And so it says that even though one trespass led to condemnation, one act of righteousness led to justification and life for all men. One man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And so it says that the law came to increase the trespass where sin increased, but grace abounded all the more that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, right after that, in Romans 6, it says, what shall we say then are we conti to continue in sin that grace may abound? And so I want to start off the conversation with these guys. And uh, Josh, I'm going to start with you, but I'm going to just read uh, these First, three, first couple of verses in Romans 6, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you uh, for some feedback. But it says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that may, grace may abound? Meaning, are we to continue to walk in sinfulness and walk in, in this old way of life that God's grace may abound? Meaning, we can sin, God's going to forgive us, so we're going to sin and do it anyways. And we abuse God's grace. We don't accept and, and acknowledge God's grace. And it continues to say, Paul says with an exclamation mark, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
And it says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by glory of the Father, this is what it says, we might too walk in newness of life. So, Josh, share a little bit. What, when we talk about we've been given newness of life, and now we've been called to walk in newness of life, what does that mean for us as believers? And what has the blood bought for us by grace that we can now pursue newness of life? Okay. Um, you know, the grace of God, you know, that, that changes, us, changes us positionally also, you know, brings about the daily transformation uh, that you've been talking about. And I think that grace, um, you know, with Paul asking that question there after explaining, you know, that as sins abound, that God's grace abounded more, you know, I, I almost think that he asked just a, a question to make people laugh almost, you know, should we continue to sin so that grace abounds? Well, we, we all know the answer to that question is, is no, uh, because he goes on to explain that we have, you know, that through Christ, we were put to death, you know, the sin inside of us, sin's bond or sin's hold on us was put to death uh, um, through the death of Christ. And so now that, you know, we have been identified or found in Christ, uh, you know, we are free from that bondage of sin uh, where, prior to our relationship with Christ um, or prior to uh, uh, God's grace covering us, we didn't have the freedom to, to not sin. Uh, we didn't have the freedom to be able to walk in righteousness. We were, as Paul says a lot, that we were slaves to sin and we had no other choice but to, to give in to that sin because we didn't have the power inside of us to break free from that. Um, and so, but by the grace of God, you know, we can walk in righteousness by the, the grace and the spirit that God's put inside me. I can, uh, choose to, uh, to to walk in righteousness where I used to couldn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's good. Come on, bro. Come on, Josh. That's good. <laughs> you going to start talking about syrup and pancakes, Josh? Lavish? <laughs> uh, lavish I, can if, I can if you want me to. Hey, I told you last night I wrote out a whole sermon, but we can't fit it in 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, yeah. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's something that you started in that because that's exactly where I started studying yesterday and I just thought the, the same emphasis you put on the transition from five to six is kind of where I, I started as well so yeah and I, I think you know what the verse right after that verse five it's so important I want to remind us it, it's all because of session one and what we talked about that even makes this possible for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So sin is no longer, it no longer dominates us in a sense. It, there, the dominion and power of sin, we've been delivered from it, but we've also been set free from the penalty of sin, which is God's wrath, his judgment on us, condemnation, that sin brought into the world, right? And so when, when God in, in his justice on the cross showed us that sin was punished in his love, it, it also showed us that sin does not have dominion over us. And so I think we, we need, as we look at the cross, we have to see that we are motivated to fight our sin and to develop and to grow in all areas of our life in God's grace. But it's all because of his love on, that was shown to us on the cross. So we see that, uh, for one, uh, for the one who has died has been set free for, from sin. And if, if you go down, it, it even says death no longer has dominion over him. But it says for the death he died, he died to sin and once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. And do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Law could not accomplish for us what grace accomplished on the cross. And so I think we have to go back and look at verse five. If we've been united with him, that our union with Christ, our God uniting us to himself through the shed blood of Jesus and us receiving and being a recipient of that grace because God called us to himself. He's called us to holiness. He's called us uh, to right living. He's called us um, to trust completely in him. 
because of that. Now it says, he gives the command, let sin not therefore reign in your mortal body to make it to obey, to, to make you obey its passions. And so Blake, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit since you're a pretty raw fella. Um, and you got a lot of red cards and you just, you just don't mind just laying it all on the line. But when we talk about sin reigning in our body and us obeying its passions, right? And then when we, when we die and we become a believer, that sin is still there, right? Yeah. And so as we fight, how, how does grace free us up to really own our sin and really is, you know, you got sent out on that field to just take somebody out. How can we have that? How does grace give us that, give us that mindset? We could just, we can go and just face, face the opponent. We can face our sin. And there's a great book that I'm going to share in a resource called the enemy within, but, but how can we really, how can we fight our sin? We can't, we don't need to blame the enemy, blame somebody else or blame God for, for our own sinfulness. It lies within us. And James 1, 13 through 15 tells us that, that we're lured and tempted by our own deceitful desires. But now as a believer, there's this war in us. Mm-hmm. So how, how does grace, Blake, how does grace free us up to own our sin and face it and then fight it? Yeah, I mean, the freedom is, is the beautiful picture of 2 Corinthians five seventeen, right? Therefore, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And there's this beautiful picture of I was this broken, angry kid. I was the kid that got put on the team to go fight other people. I was the kid that other people hated being around when I got angry because I was just a jerk. I was a bully. I had, I had so much burning inside of me. And then in Christ, I was a new creation. I was freed from that. I was freed from those chains, right? It's just like we talked about on Tuesday, who the sun sets free is free indeed, and we can celebrate that. But there's also the reality that in this broken, sinful world, that in my flesh, I'm still, I still get angry, right? Sure. That I still have some of these same like demons and sinful like traits in my flesh. But, but where the freedom comes is I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And through the spirit of the living God working through me, my desires are not mine, but they're his. And so the difference is the transformation of my heart and mind that my flesh may fail. My flesh may be angry. My flesh may still want to smoke pot. My flesh may still want to fight somebody. My flesh may still lust, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So there's the spirit of like the living, breathing God, the empty tomb, the God who defeated death is the God who's resurrected my life. So there's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so because of that powerful truth that the living God lives in me, I'm not scared of my sin. Like, I don't go around being scared, like, oh, what if somebody makes me angry and I blow up? Like, oh, what if I get tempted to do this? But it's this idea of my sin doesn't hold me back because I'm living with a greater vision. I'm living with a greater purpose. I'm not a slave to those transgressions. I'm not a slave to that sin, but I'm a servant of Christ who is actively living in me, who is actively sanctifying my heart, right? We were justified on the cross and we're sanctified by the spirit as we continue to grow and our desires change and our heart and our mind changes. Our focus really changes. So I hope I'm kind of answering your question here, Brandon, but I really just want like, I can, we can defeat sin. We can be better than sin, not because of anything we're doing because we're still that same broken flesh but we've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And through the living God that's doing a work in my heart and mind, I'm able to face my sin and conquer my sin because of our living God. Yeah, that's good, Blake. Amen. Um, yeah, it's real good. And we could, you could spend time peeling back 20 more layers of just some things you talked about, but that was a good yeah. overview. But Hey Mike, I'm going to ask you, um, I know that, uh, you know, you're a pretty competitive guy and you love sport and love keeping up with uh, fantasy football. And uh, you're, you're the reigning champ in your fantasy football league, aren't you? I think a couple, back years, champ. couple years in a row. I hope the, uh, the old guys talking sports group text doesn't watch this video and, and see that you're, <laughs> you're boasting in um, your championships. But uh, I'm just telling you facts. I'm not boasting. 
<laughs> Cause you have a trophy to prove it. And, um, so yeah, I what, get it. No, nah, we don't have to do that. Would that would be boasting. That would be boasting. <laughs> but Hey, uh, give us, give us some feedback, Mike, on, you know, talking about development, you know, speaking to, to athletes and coaches, you know, we love the development of athletes. We love to develop programs. We love to develop, um, you know, winning teams. And there's a process that takes place. And I know now it's 2020 and we hear that all the time, trust the process. And we, we see all these athletes partaking on this process and this journey specifically athletically to achieve uh, athletic success. And there's nothing wrong with that. I love to grind it out and I love to see guys working hard. I was actually working out yesterday and um, I'm trying to stay a little bit in shape. And I, I, I wrote a workout on the board and man, I wanted to, I wanted to quit. And then I grinded it out and finished. And I just thought, man, how, how many times did that happen in my career where, uh, and, and in my playing career where um, I just wanted to give up or I wanted to give in to just quitting or I wanted to give in to uh, just throwing in the towel and not trusting that process. But talk about maybe what it looks like. And, and it could be daily. What does it look like when we, when we get to a place where we think that temptation is um, yeah, temptation, maybe knocking at our door, the, a, a past struggle and sin and habit, maybe knocking at our door, but we now know and identify as Blake said, we've been crucified with Christ. We say, in our, we say to ourselves, I've died to this, but now I want to live to God. I want to present myself to God. What, what does it look like by God's grace to, to pursue the process of, growing in holiness to where in those moments we take steps and, and what steps are those? What does that look like practically? What are some things that you do as maybe temptation knocks at your door or there's some maybe past sin habits that knock at your door or you're confronted with maybe uh, a little fleshly response in some area? What, what is it that you turn to? What is it that you do to, to, to help you to continue to persevere towards, towards your goal? And ultimately, as an athlete, that's what they do, right? The coach always says, hey, we can't give up. Hey, it's a, we got a second half of ball to play, and the first half doesn't define us. We got to continue on because we got four quarters. And at the end of these four quarters, whatever happens, happens, but we're going to leave it all on the field. So how, how as believers do we leave it all on the field, and how do we go back out with the mentality that we're going to continue to run this race? Uh First of all, nobody knows more about trusting the process than the Miami Dolphins fan, right, Blake? Um, but uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Brandon, it, it's so easy. Uh, me growing up, like a coach's speech, uh, like I love all the sports movies where you got that famous coach speech and just fires you up, and you're like, I just want to hit pause, and I just want to go play a sport. I just want to go compete. I want to go knock somebody out. When I'm doing football, or I want to go shoot a shot over somebody's face in basketball, right? And uh, it's just something about us that sports rile us up to like want to just go. But then it comes to our spiritual life. It's like, it just feels like I got nothing sometimes. Sometimes it feels like, where is that motivation? Like, uh, where do I find it? Where do I seek it? And, and a lot of times it, it doesn't just come from, or it may come from your preacher or a pastor who is very fiery and fires you up, but it doesn't really last long. It seems like, uh, and, and I think that God's word is what's going to fuel that. Um, you know, going along with our text, uh, you know, it's Josh on this a little bit where Paul's like, people are asking him the question. So because of grace, can we just go on sinning however we want? And he's like, by no means, right? Like, no. And, and, and you look and we look in scripture and I think you see in verse 14 for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. And so like I, I Brandon mentioned in the beginning, grace does allow us to face our sin. Because without grace, every time we look at sin, we know we are defeated, and we don't like that. Like that, you look at your sin, it should heap on you shame and guilt without grace, because we deserve the wrath of God. There is defeat, no victory. But because of grace, we can look at our sin, we can face it, because we were reminded in God's grace that we, uh, Jesus, right, took on all of our sin, covered it all, took on the full wrath of God in our place. There is victory in Jesus, and this allows us to look at our sin, not be afraid of it, like Blake said, because we know of the victory we find in Jesus, and that's the hope we cling to. We don't cling on our own works, but we cling to his works, what he has done, not what we are called necessarily 
to do. There is a calling to that, but it's nothing that we do to earn it. But we go from that victory to fight against our, our flesh, to fight against our sin. Um, you know, uh, what was it? James 4.1, what causes quarrels and fights amongst you? Is it not the passions that are at war within you? You're at a war. Your flesh is pulling you one way. The spirit's pulling you another way to follow Christ. There is a all out war going on all around us. And we must be aware of that as an athlete, if you go into a game and you don't realize that that opponent's trying to crush you, you're going to get crushed. If you don't prepare yourself, if you don't get in the right mindset, if you don't like study even your opponent, right? The enemy wants to accuse you uh, as our enemy is Satan in our flesh of this sin and make us feel like we don't deserve this to what you say, of course I don't deserve this. That's the whole beauty of the gospel and of God's grace and his love and mercy to us. Yeah, but back to, to the text, is in chapter 6, verse 17. It says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to this, uh, obedient to the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. Now, because of what God has done, we got to ask ourselves the question are we committed? Are we all in? That's what a coach is asking for. Are you committed? Are you all in? Like, let's go do this. And in some sense, Paul's reminding us. Are, God's done the work, but he's called us to something. Are we going to stay committed in his word, committed in seeking his kingdom first and not ours, dying to ourselves daily, right? And, and following Jesus. And uh, that's the war where we need people around us, just like a team. You need teammates to pick you up when you're down. We need brothers and sisters in Christ around us, pointing us constantly to Jesus. Hmm. Gathering of the saints on the poor. And, and being committed and being reminded of God's grace. And we need that in our life and we need his word in our life. I probably could keep going, but I'll just kind of pause right there. <laughs> yeah, so. that's good. So, so what do you think? Um, what, I mean, think practically. You trust the process as an athlete or a coach, right? As a coach, you watch film. Um, you, uh, you spend time at practice uh, critiquing the guys. You, you, you prepare, right? You have a schedule. Um, you get in the weight room, you got a condition, you encourage the guys that they need to get sleep and have a consistent diet. Like there's all these disciplines that goes in as a coach um, to, to be able to maximize the opportunities that have been given. And then as an athlete, I mean, then you got to follow the regimen, right? You got to, I mean, you have to be all in and committed to, to all those things to at the end of the day, be able to, I know, you know, we're just strictly talking football, but on a Friday night to be able to roll out on the field and say, I'm ready. We watch film. Uh, I've got my rest. I'm hydrated. I'm prepared. I'm ready to go. And now we always know that the outcome and, you know, in, in a game, it may, it, just because we commit to the process, we may not always win. So Michael, what are the moments um, uh, or what, what are some things that, that we should do maybe if we fall? That maybe we're, we, we do, we're committed to the process, right? Because even if we lose a game, we don't give up. We go back to the drawing board. We go back to the same film. We go back to the same regimen. We go back to, to, to the same water that we drank. We go back to the same Gatorade, like the same chicken sandwiches and chicken burritos at Chick-fil-A, right, Blake? Um, but, but, we, but we go, we go yeah, hallelujah, amen. Um, but we, but we, go back, we go back to these same things as an athlete because we know they're proven to work. Yeah. What disciplines does God's word tell us? And what things have we been called to do as a believer that God said that these things have proved to work, but, but we, may have, we may have fallen into sin, right? We may have given into temptation. Uh, we may have – we may have fell. And, and we see this in Scripture. I mean – we, we see this in the life of David, right? It, David fell consider, just miserably into sin, and then it cultivated more sins. But I'm just reminded of, you know, Psalm 51 and, and just his response to it. Against you, God, I've only, against you and you alone have I sinned. And he asked God to cleanse him and forgive him and, and do some things in him. I think that's the development piece. So what are we called to do practically? And what are some disciplines and some tangible things that we can do in response to maybe failure in response to us knowing that we've sinned against God and we may not want to own up to it, but what are some things that we can engage in that'll help us to continue to pursue the journey that God's called us to, to partake on? Yeah. I think it'd be good to hear from the other guys too on this. Cause that's, that's like an, a lot of things, but sure. I want to, I want to start by saying this, 
is um, I think the beauty of the gospel. We we know we have we've seen minds right like it comes back to haunt us in, in some sense and I think sometimes that can be a grace like the enemy is trying but God is still using that to remind us of our sinful flesh and maybe even like hey like because of God's grace I'm reminded of that but I know I'm reminded of His forgiveness I'm reminded that I don't deserve this. I'm reminded that it is God who saved me. I'm reminded that God who is changing me. And that's the old flesh. God has called me to a new self, a new creation, his son. And I think that's power of the gospel. In the same sense, like when you make a mistake in, in uh, playing your sport and a coach gets all over you, and they're reminding you of that so you don't make that mistake again. Like it's a sense where we can use that for fuel to fight against that sin, not to feel shame and guilt. That's what the enemy wants. But I think Christ is saying, no, I've, I've, like, was it Romans 5, 8, right? Uh, he died for us yet while we were still sinners. Like, I love you no matter what. S stop listening to that. Be reminded of it and know that that's, that's the old you and, and move forward in that. And I think that's what motivates us because of grace to say, you know what? I feel so guilty to even open my Bible. Like, I don't even deserve to do this. I feel guilty to share the gospel with somebody. Like, who am I to do that? And it's like, look, you didn't earn or deserve it. Like it's you by the power of Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me is what motivates you to go do that. And you have the, the key to life. I mean, you, you know, the, the good news to give someone life and hope. And, uh, and I think this is what should motivate us to go do that, to live this out, even while we know we make mistakes. And as we can continue to sin and as we struggle with some things, being open and honest, and, uh, you know, seeking repentance, repentance means to turn away from your sin and turn to Christ and being honest about it with somebody and maybe even somebody you're trying to witness to, uh, to show that you're not perfect. Only Christ is. And that's who I'm boasting in. And that's who I'm claiming. And that's who I'm telling you about. And I think that can flesh its way out in so many different things, um, that we can be anchored in to remind ourselves to be in the word daily. And I'm just gonna leave it this and I'll let the guys talk is first thing in the morning, if it's the first thing I do is get in the word, it sets my day up. I mean, if I first thing get on my phone, I start scrolling on social media or I start comparing myself or thinking about all this and that, like it kind of sets my day off to that con to consume me. But if I start out with God's word, it sets my heart in line with what is true, what I'm called to and motivates me to be committed and to be all in to go live for Christ that day. Um, I don't know what you guys would add to that. That's just, yeah, I know. Uh, I know we got to get off here in a, in a little bit. And Josh, I know you got another call to jump on. So, um, hey, w feel free, Josh, uh, just to give some closing thoughts. I know you got a sermon wrote, but maybe just give some clo closing thoughts on, on kind of kind of what the Spirit's kind of just working in you now, as we as we've shared, and maybe some things that you've you've thought through. And then you're welcome to just get off. And then me, Blake, and Michael will close it and wrap it up. But I don't want to I don't want to rush you. Uh, I don't want to necessarily keep you on and make you rush to get on your other call. So any closing thoughts, Josh, before you get off and, and jump on another call? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess I got two things I really wanted to, I guess, to highlight. And then, uh, like I said, maybe I'll make a little clip and, and talk a little more about it later. But, um, you know, I think uh, in Romans 12, uh, 1 through 2, uh, we get a, a picture of, of kind of how this plays out or how this can be played out. Uh, uh, Paul says, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Because obviously he's laying out, that's, you know, that's our goal. That's what we want to do is we want to offer our bodies. He's echoing what he said in, in Romans 6, I believe it is, that we offer our bodies as weapons of righteousness. You know, so that's our goal as, as followers of Christ. And in verse 2, I think he lays out kind of how we can walk through that process. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by renewing of your mind that you may discern what is the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. And so in that, I think it's important. It gives me the picture too, uh, when we look at that, 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 you know, be transformed, that's in a continual being transformed daily, you know? And so when we look at that, uh, I'm reminded of when Jesus, when they came to Jesus and they said they wanted to follow him. He said, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, take your cross daily and follow me. So there's a daily dying to myself. Uh, this is uh, Mike talked about getting up and, and if he starts his day with God's word, you know, that sets the stage for everything. And so in my life, what I've found that is waking up in the morning and starting each day dying to myself, God wants to do in that day.
for it. Now, do, do I do that perfectly every day? Absolutely not. But that's where I start my day. And, uh, and so in that, you know, he gives us a warning not to be conformed to this age. And so that gives us this picture that we, ha we have these outside forces. We have this inside war raging within us because we're wrapped in this flesh. But we also have these outside forces in culture and society and, and all these things pressing in to try to mold our thinking and, and, and to, to get us to go a certain direction. And, and so, God, you know, Paul is warning, you know, don't let those things conform you, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's where God's word comes in. You know, uh, if we're going to be transformed, if we're not going to be conformed, then we've got to be transformed by something. And the only thing that can do that is through the power of God's word transforming our lives. Uh, you know, God's already given us a new heart. We are a new cre creation. But but through the power of his spirit, he will take his word and live it out through us if we if we'll just devote ourselves to it. So uh, I guess for, for you guys listening, I just want to challenge you to really dive in, devour God's word, learn to 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 really study it and to love God's word and watch it change your life. And, and the second thing is something I struggled with all my life uh, or when I became a Christian, my, 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 my personality has always been I want to be the best at whatever I'm doing. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're throwing rocks. I want to throw rocks better than you. Uh, you know, that's just my personality. I go 100% all in whatever I'm doing. So when I was sinning, I sinned as hard as I could go. And so when I gave my life to Christ, I ran as hard as I could. I wanted to learn as much as I could, and I wanted to be as obedient as I could. But what I found out is when I would fall, you know, Satan would beat me to death with that, or I would beat my own self with that. And so what I want to remind you guys is that, you know, you will fall, you will have hardships, but go back to the, to the, to the change in position that grace gave you. Uh, because it's something that took me a long time over my life to learn that when I fail, I'm still all right. I'm his child, you know, and I know uh, Michael touched on that, but that was something that took me a long time to understand. And it would push me further and further away from God because instead of repenting and running through his word, I would shut everything else out and I would find myself out in left field. And so what I want to encourage you guys is that you will fail, but as you fall, quickly run back to God and, and, and realize and just rest in the fact that your position has changed. You are his, nothing can change that. And then move forward, repent and move forward. So that's kind of, that's kind of to wrap up my thoughts on that. Maybe, um, you know, I do have a lot of other things. Maybe I will do a clip later, but that's yeah. kind of to wrap up my thoughts on that. Yeah. That's I appreciate good, it. John. I'm just staring out my note to close. Uh, our death to sin is not only an objective fact, but it's an ongoing process of dying to ourselves. right? Objective meaning it doesn't, it doesn't change. We, We've died. We've already died because we've been buried with Christ and we've been raised with him. So the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, it, 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 we, we trade places, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the righteousness that's been given to us by God and, and the identity that we have is all because of him. It's nothing we did. But now we work this out because we have a responsibility um, to pursue holiness. And we're going to look at just one more scripture. But I got to go. Josh, thanks, man. Love you, bud. Uh, yeah. See ya. Hey, but let's let's look at one 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 little chunk of scripture to close, Mike and Blake. And these are in two different books. Uh, it's kind of um, they're kind of sister books or brother books, whatever you want to call them. But Ephesians and Colossians, it tells us that we'll go Ephesians four first, and it and it says that. Um, says that, now I say this and testify in the Lord, this is verse 17, says that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous and given, them the, given up themselves to sensuality, uh, greediness, and practice of every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed, and we, we, we heard Josh share that, in the spirit of your minds, and to put on now the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then it gets practical. It talks about things that are now played out in our life day to day. Therefore, put away falsehood. Speak the truth with your neighbor. We're members of one another. Don't be angry. Do not sin. Don't give, give no opportunity to the devil. Uh, let no thief longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his hands. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, 
build one another up. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and slander be put away with you along with malice. Be kind to one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And then it says in five, be imitators of God as beloved children. It says, walk in love. It says, it says but sexual immorality and all these things uh, is not proper among you. Let no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking. They're out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And it continues to go on. Walk as children of the light. Do not, do not be someone who not only partakes uh, with darkness, for you were at one time darkness. You were dead. But then it says, uh, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. If, if anything, um, yeah, is exposed in the light, it becomes visible, and it becomes visible in the light. And then it talks about how not to live as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. So there's a lot of things wrapped up in that. And even in Colossians, um, I'll just read it real quick, and then we'll close with some closing thoughts. Uh, we, we see in Colossians 3, right after it, it, it tells us who we already are, our, our identity. Right? It says, you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, right? Set your minds on the things that are above. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And then in five, it says, this is practical day-to-day -day life. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And so we've been called to put these things to death. And then it says in 12, put these things on. So in 10, we put on the new self, which be, is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. And, and we put on what God's called us to put on. And, and this is... This is the pursuit of godliness, right? This is the development that takes place. Um, and so any closing thoughts as we talk about uh, how do we, you know, we, we've been clothed with righteousness, but we're called now to clothe and put on righteous living. We're, we're called to pursue righteous living. Um, I know there's a lot that could be talked to, you know, to that specifically, but when we, when we create new habits, when God cause us to create some new habits in our life and new processes and new rhythms. I like to say um, we, we adopt these rhythms of daily rhythms of seeking God's word, right? Daily rhythms of, Hey, we acknowledge this sin daily and we, we put it to death. We die to it. We, we confess it to the Lord. We confess our weakness. We rely upon him for his strength and his power. And we ask God to work in us, to change us that I know Michael likes to say a lot. We, we allow God to, to grow in us to hate the things God hates and to love the things God loves, right? And so any closing thoughts as it pertains to that when we, you know, we think through, and, and you can get a little practical if you want, but when we think about students, we think about coaches with, with marriages and families and um, the busyness of sport, the, the idolatry of sport, just craving a championship, crazy, craving success, craving uh, people to notice them or um, – whatever it may be. And we, you know, think of a student, they're walking the halls, you know, they're, they're on and off the field developing um, and they're pursuing academics. They're pursuing friendships. They're pursuing um, their sport after school, it, whatever it would be. What does it look like for an individual to, to, to develop and create rhythms and processes and habits centered or centered around those truths? Yeah, I mean, I'll share a few thoughts. I know we got to close up here because we're running long. I want to be respectful to everyone watching. But, but one thing when I think of just like practical, how in the world do we do this? I think we would be wrong not to share the importance of accountability. Like we, we can't like do this by ourselves. One, we can't do anything outside of the work of the Holy Spirit. But there is like just foundational life-changing truth in doing life with other people. I know that the three of us have formed an accountability group and we, we communicate every single day and we pray for each other and we confess to each other and we correct each other. And there's like this beautiful like life change where I think all three of us would say that over the last year of kind of doing this, we've all kind of become better men because of it. And so this idea of having people who you can just be honest with and say, you know what, man, I've messed up or you know what, I'm struggling or you know what, I just need help. But also the importance of accountability is it has to be this openness that you're going to be rebuked, that you're going to be crushed, that while they, they love, receive you in love, there's truth that like accountability is hard sometimes. 
And when you slip up, you need to be corrected. You need that tough love because it makes you better. In the same way, when you make a mistake on the field or on your court, your coach corrects you, and sometimes harshly. But it's okay to receive that with love. It's okay to, to take on tough love, to be corrected, because ultimately we're never going to get better if we're coddled. We're never going to get better. We're never going to grow. We're never going to reach like who God's really called us to be if we're not okay with being corrected, if we're not okay with, with that growth. And so I just want to share, like, practically be accountable to people. Ha like, have coaches you can talk to. Maybe it's your parents, maybe some older siblings, some close friends, but have a group of people that you can be honest with and who are you are willing to let correct you. Um, it's just something I really wanted to share yeah. uh, because I know, like, I remember being 17 and giving my life to Christ and trying to make a – a 180 change on who I was. I needed people to speak truth in my life and I needed people to hold me accountable. I needed people that I could tell how I was feeling, what I was thinking is, it's really unbelievably crucial no matter how old you are and no matter what phase of life you're in. Yeah, that's good, Blake. And we're going to dig in session seven in the trenches, um, looking at accountability uh, a little bit, a lot deeper into that. But if I'm hearing you correctly, Blake, I, I think, you didn't say this specifically, but it's jumped to my mind, and I, I think you'll agree with it. But we need we need people in our life that are pursuing the same thing, right? Yeah. And we need people in our life that want to be – that know who they are in Christ, want to be reminded of who they are in Christ, and they want to grow in Christ. And so are you saying, Blake uh, – and I, I know that we've, you know, probably all experienced this in student ministry, you know, kids that – they're a little scared, right? They're a little timid. They seem inferior uh, to, to people around them that they can't, they can't talk about their sin struggle, right? They can't talk about their pornography habit or they can't talk about their anger that is in, within them or maybe they can't talk about what happens at home or maybe they can't talk about being bullied at school. But I think, you know, even what I'm hearing from you, Blake, is that the challenge to those that may be watching that, this thing has been building up in you and hidden and, and we, you know, there's, there's been some guys that I've sat down with and have shared things that I don't know if they've ever shared. And I'm sure that y'all have had that experience too. And then as they do it, they realize, okay, well, that wasn't as bad as maybe I thought it was going to be. It, that felt, it, it felt kind of good to share. But as we, as we engage in those conversations, like I think it is, as you said, it's wise to find coaches, find mentors, find, friends and surround yourself with those people that are seeking to develop the same way you are right they're, they're seeking yeah. to pursue christ likeness the same yeah same absolutely I, in fact i actually preached a message uh called don't say the f word at our church a couple months ago and the f word is being fine like i one thing my wife and i we argue about is i ask you how are you doing i'm fine or what yeah. do you think about this it's fine and I've noticed with students especially, they never like to open up. How are you? I'm good. How are things? Good. You know, we're in the middle of this pandemic where everyone's st stuck at their home. Nobody's really able to get together. And you reach out, hey, man, I know times are tough. I know you're missing your sport, your friends, and, and everything. How are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm a little bored, but I'm good. But life, life change doesn't happen with fine. Like just saying I'm good doesn't change. Like you've got to be willing. Account uh, what Brandon said is 100% true. You've got to have accountability, but you've got to have like openness. You've got to admit struggles. You've got to admit sin. You've got to admit like your, short your shortcomings. Like you've got to admit these things inside of you so that you can truly grow. That's a good word, Brandon. Yeah, Michael, anything to close? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, one of the things that I was always told the guy discipled me was uh, it wasn't his, but he used it a lot is the person that loves you the most tells you the most truth um, or tells you the truth, right? Whatever that is. And I think in sports, there's been something wired in us where we just accept whether it's harsh criticism or it, and which can be very helpful. Uh, we accept that from a coach. You know, sometimes it's, it's tough. But you know that coach is it's for your good, for the team's good, trying to make you better, and you buy into that. That's what all in means. Like the coach is saying, like, trust me, if I get on you, it's because I'm trying to make you better. It's for your good. And students, athletes buy into that and they're okay with that. But then all of a sudden, 
somebody else speaks something spiritually into your life and you're highly offended or you want to block them out or you don't want to let them in or you don't want to take any criticism about your spiritual life. And I think we have to have this renewing of mind mindset, this commitment of being committed to Christ is saying, I'm going to do life with other believers. I'm going to seek accountability. I'm going to welcome that in as much as that hurts. Uh, you know, so many times I'm like, I don't want to get in the word. Then I get in the word and every time I'm so thankful I did. Man, I don't feel like praying. I pray and I get done and I'm really thankful I prayed. I want to listen to a certain time, type of music and I'm like, ah, someone's tugging on me to listen to worship music. I do it. I'm so thankful I did. And it's the same thing with sharing your faith. I'm like, I don't want to share my faith right now. And I go share it. I'm like, why don't I do this more often? And it's the same thing with accountability. I sit down. I don't want to tell someone of my sin. And every time I do, I feel weight lifted. I feel God was all in it. Um, and I feel free. Like that's the freedom. That's the grace um, that I think God has gifted us, the church, the body of believers to help us with. Um, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to add. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, we talked about, um, what was it, Titus 2, about how grace trains us to renounce, um, uh, you know, ungodliness, worldliness, lack of self-control. But without that grace, right, this is who we are. We are a people that are being, um, if we're not seeking God's word to transform us, we're going to be transformed by the world. We're just going to be worldly. We're going to be so ungodly. We're going to lack so much self-control. And so it's God's grace and his power that gives us these things. This is his gifting. This is the Josh hit on it. You know, the, the um, progressive sanctification of God working in our life. I'm going to complete the work I've done in you. Um, and so we know that we can trust God with that, but we must actively pursue it in our life. And um, scripture memory <laughs> is good. I mean, everybody sometimes rolls their eyes at scripture memory, but I'm telling you, it changed my life. I wish I could do a lot more. And the one verse I always uh, memorized was this, and I'll close with this and kick it to you, Brandon, is um, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 13. And this reminds us how to fight and wage war against temptation. It's good news. It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And that's my favorite verse, one of my favorite verses that gives me so much hope that I'm not in this alone. That's what sin wants to make us think, man, you're so bad. You're the only one dealing with this and you're not. Uh, and there's always a way of escape because why? God is faithful. And so I'll leave it there. Yeah, and I, that's good. Um, but we could go another whole hour at least. Uh, yeah, let's go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm fired up right now. I know. I, I want to read this. This is from the Discipline of Grace, and we shared this the other day. Uh, and I ordered three copies. I got Blake one on one, so I'm going to send him one. But um, I got two copies. If you want one, let us know. I'll, I'll come deliver it in your mailbox at your house or leave it on the front doorstep. But I want to read this on page 122. And, and I want us to understand when we, when we pursue godliness, we pursue new habits, processes, and rhythms in our life that God is, is producing in us, right? And, and I'm gonna do, we're going to do a separate video. I'm going to do a couple just on what that looks like and give some practical, some practical steps and some just the little points that maybe we can do on a daily basis to accomplish some of these things that, that God's calling us to. But I want to read this because I think it's very important that we must, we must pursue these things out of a motive of love. And there's, there's, other, there's other motivators and factors that can go into us per, per, uh, pursuing godliness, and, and, and they won't last, and they're going to be bad motivators for us. But listen to, the, to what this says. It says, it says that, uh, that love gives validity to my actions and makes them acceptable to God. I can seek the welfare of my enemies so they hopefully will be nice to me or not harm me again. That's not love. It's manipulation. It's looking out for my welfare, welfare uh, under the, the guise of looking out for theirs. Love for God, then, is the only accept, acceptable motive for obedience to him. This love may express itself in a reverence for him and a desire to please him, but those expressions must spring from love. Without the motive of love, my apparent obedience may be essentially self-serving. Negatively, I may fear God may punish me or at least withhold his blessing from me because of some disobedience. I may abstain from a particular sinful action out of fear. I will be found out or because I don't want to feel guilty afterwards. Positively, I may be seeking to earn God's blessing through some pious actions. I may conform to a certain standard of conduct because I want to fit in with and be accepted by the Christian culture in which I live. 
I may even obey outwardly because I have a compliant temperament and it is simply my nature to obey my parents, my teacher, civil authorities, or even God. And it says all these motives, both negative and positive, may result in an outward form of obedience, but it's not obedience from the heart. Our behavior may appear outstanding to the other people, but not acceptable to God because it does not spring from a motive of love to him. Only conduct that arises from love is worthy of the name of obedience. And this is what it says to close. To love God with our heart, soul, and mind, and to obey him wholeheartedly and diligently are like the two sides of a coin. You can't have one without the other. Fervency of worship on Sunday morning or in our private devotions is vain without accompanying fervency and obedience to God. On the other hand, precise and exact obedience to the law of God is vain if not prompted by love for him. And so John Calvin uh, wrote this, um, uh, and I thought, it, I thought it was good, but it says, Christ means by this that only the free service of our wills is acceptable to him. Ultimately, the man who comes to obey God will love him first. Let us therefore learn that the love of God is the beginning of religion, for God will not have the forced obedience of men, but wishes their service to be free and spontaneous. Lastly, we learn that God does not linger over the outward sign of achievement, but chiefly searches the inner disposition, the motive, that from a good root, good fruits must follow and may grow. And I think that is just, I mean, that's just spot on. And so good fruit is going to only follow and grow from a good root. And that must be rooted in the love of Christ. And that's why being saved by grace and grace alone is so crucial to us understanding our transformation of grace in day-to-day -day life. So, hey, guys, I enjoyed it. Um, I appreciate y'all being on. I hope this has been helpful uh, for those that have been viewing. And we're going to have some more videos that will be posted up in response to this, as well as a study guide that will have a lot more information um, and, and we probably will only still be scratching the surface. So I uh, appreciate it, Blake. Thanks, Michael. And we'll see you guys on session three. Deuces.